Climate change denial, has been summarized as the global warming controversy. It involves denial, dismissal, or unwarranted doubt that contradicts the scientific opinion on climate change, including the extent to which it is caused by humans, its impacts on nature and human society, or the potential of adaptation to global warming by human actions. Some deniers endorse the term, while others prefer the term climate change skepticism. Several scientists have noted that skepticism is an inaccurate description for those who deny anthropogenic global warming. Climate change denial can also be implicit, when individuals or social groups accept the science but fail to come to terms with it or to translate their acceptance into action. Several social science studies have analyzed these positions as forms of denialism and pseudoscience. The campaign to undermine public trust in climate science has been described as a denial machine", organized by industrial, political and ideological interests, and supported by conservative media and skeptical bloggers to manufacture uncertainty about global warming. The politics of global warming have been affected by climate change denial, undermining the efforts to act on climate change or adapting to the warming climate. Those promoting denial commonly use rhetorical tactics to give the appearance of a scientific controversy where there is none. Organized campaigning to undermine public trust in climate science is associated with conservative economic policies and backed by industrial interests opposed to the regulation of CO2 emissions. Climate change denial has been associated with the fossil fuels lobby, the Koch brothers, industry advocates and conservative think tanks, often in the United States. More than 90% of papers skeptical on climate change originate from right-wing think tanks. Since the late 1970s, oil companies have published research broadly in line with the standard views on global warming. Despite this, oil companies organized a climate change denial campaign to disseminate public disinformation for several decades, a strategy that has been compared to the organized denial of the hazards of tobacco smoking by the tobacco industry. Terminology <inaudible> 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 Climate change denial refer to denial, dismissal or unwarranted doubt of the scientific consensus on the rate and extent of global warming, its significance, or its connection to human behavior, in whole or in part. Though there is a distinction between skepticism which indicates doubting the truth of an assertion and outright denial of the truth of an assertion, in the public debate phrases such as, climate skepticism have frequently been used with the same meaning as climate denialism or contrarianism the terminology emerged in the 1990s even though all scientists adhere to scientific skepticism as an inherent part of the process by mid november 1995 the word skeptic was being used specifically for the minority who publicized views contrary to the scientific consensus this small group of scientists presented their views in public statements and the media, rather than to the scientific community. This usage continued. In his December 1995 article The Heat is On, The Warming of the World's Climate Sparks a Blaze of Denial, Ross Gelbspan said industry had engaged a small band of skeptics to confuse public opinion in a persistent and well-funded campaign of denial. His 1997 book The Heat Is On may have been the first to concentrate specifically on the topic. In it, Gelbspan discussed a «pervasive denial of global warming» in a «persistent campaign of denial and suppression» involving «undisclosed funding of these greenhouse skeptics» with «the climate skeptics» confusing the public and influencing decision makers a november 2006 cbc television documentary on the campaign was titled the denial machine in 2007 journalist sharon begley reported on the denial machine a phrase subsequently used by academics in addition to explicit denial social groups have shown implicit denial by accepting the scientific consensus but failing to come to terms with its implications or take action to reduce the problem 
This was exemplified in Kari Norgard's study of a village in Norway affected by climate change, where residents diverted their attention to other issues. The terminology is debated. Most of those actively rejecting the scientific consensus use the terms skeptic and climate change skepticism, and only a few have expressed preference for being described as deniers, but the word skepticism is incorrectly used, as scientific skepticism is an intrinsic part of scientific methodology. The term contrarian is more specific, but used less frequently. In academic literature and journalism, the terms climate change denial and climate change deniers have well-established usage as descriptive terms without any pejorative intent. Both the National Center for Science Education and historian Spencer R. Wirt recognize that either option is problematic, but have decided to use climate change denial rather than skepticism. Terms related to denialism have been criticized for introducing a moralistic tone, and potentially implying a link with Holocaust denial. There have been claims that this link is intentional, which academics have strongly disputed. The usage of denial long predates the Holocaust, and is commonly applied in other areas such as HIV, AIDS denialism. The claim is described by John Timmer of Ars Technica as itself being a form of denial. In December 2014, an open letter from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry called on the media to stop using the term skepticism when referring to climate change denial. They contrasted scientific skepticism, which is foundational to the scientific method with denial the a priori rejection of ideas without objective consideration and the behavior of those involved in political attempts to undermine climate science they said not all individuals who call themselves climate change skeptics are deniers but virtually all deniers have falsely branded themselves as skeptics by perpetrating this misnomer, journalists have granted undeserved credibility to those who reject science and scientific inquiry." In June 2015 Media Matters for America were told by the New York Times public editor that the newspaper was increasingly tending to use, "...denier," when, "...someone is challenging established science." But assessing this on an individual basis with no fixed policy, and would not use the term when someone was kind of wishy washy on the subject or in the middle. The executive director of the Society of Environmental Journalists said that while there was reasonable skepticism about specific issues, she felt that denier was the most accurate term when someone claims there is no such thing as global warming, or agrees that it exists but denies that it has any cause we could understand or any impact that could be measured." The Committee for Skeptical Inquiry letter inspired a petition by Climatetruth.org in which signers were asked to tell the Associated Press, establish a rule in the app stylebook ruling out the use of skeptic to describe those who deny scientific facts. On September 22, 2015, the Associated Press announced an addition to app stylebook entry on global warming, which advised to describe those who don't accept climate science or dispute the world is warming from man-made forces, use climate change doubters or those who reject mainstream climate science. Avoid use of skeptics or deniers." On May 17, 2019, The Guardian also rejected use of the term, "...climate skeptic," in favor of, "...climate science denier." History Research on the effect of CO2 on the climate began in 1824, when Joseph Fourier inferred the existence the atmospheric «greenhouse effect». In 1860, John Tyndall quantified the effects of greenhouse gases on absorption of infrared radiation. Svante Arrhenius in 1896 showed that coal burning could cause global warming, and in 1938 Guy Stewart Callender found it already happening to some extent. Research advanced rapidly after 1940. From 1957, Roger Revelle alerted the public to risks that fossil fuel burning was 
a grandiose scientific experiment on climate. NASA and NOAA took on research. The 1979 Charney report concluded that substantial warming was already on the way, and a wait and see policy may mean waiting until it is too late. In 1959 a scientist working for Shell suggested in a New Scientist article, that carbon cycles are too vast to upset nature's balance. In response to increasing public awareness of the greenhouse effect in the 1970s, conservative reaction built up, denying environmental concerns which could lead to government regulation. With the 1981 presidency of Ronald Reagan, global warming became a political issue, with immediate plans to cut spending on environmental research, particularly climate-related, and stop funding for CO2 monitoring. Reagan appointed as Secretary of Energy James B. Edwards, who said that there was no real global warming problem. Congressman Al Gore had studied under Ravel and was aware of the developing science. He joined others in arranging congressional hearings from 1981 onwards, with testimony by scientists including Ravel, Stephen Schneider, and Wallace Smith Broker. The hearings gained enough public attention to reduce the cuts in atmospheric research. A polarized party political debate developed. In 1982 Sherwood BIDSO published his book Carbon Dioxide, Friend or Foe, which said increases in CO2 would not warm the planet, but would fertilize crops and were something to be encouraged and not suppressed, while complaining that his theories had been rejected by the scientific establishment. An Environmental Protection Agency EPA report in 1983 said global warming was not a theoretical problem but a threat whose effects will be felt within a few years, with potentially catastrophic consequences. The Reagan administration reacted by calling the report alarmist, and the dispute got wide news coverage. Public attention turned to other issues, then the 1985 finding of a polar ozone hole brought a swift international response. To the public, this was related to climate change and the possibility of effective action, but news interest faded. Public attention was renewed amidst summer droughts and heat waves when James Hansen testified to a congressional hearing on 23 June 1988, stating with high confidence that long term warming was underway with severe warming likely within the next 50 years, and warning of likely storms and floods. There was increasing media attention, the scientific community had reached a broad consensus that the climate was warming, human activity was very likely the primary cause, and there would be significant consequences if the warming trend was not curbed. These facts encouraged discussion about new laws concerning environmental regulation, which was opposed by the fossil fuel industry. From 1989 onwards, industry funded organizations, including the Global Climate Coalition and the George C. Marshall Institute, sought to spread doubt among the public in a strategy already developed by the tobacco industry. A small group of scientists opposed to the consensus on global warming became politically involved, and with support from conservative political interests, began publishing in books and the press rather than in scientific journals. This small group of scientists included some of the same people that were part of the strategy already tried by the tobacco industry. Spencer Wirt identifies this period as the point where legitimate skepticism about basic aspects of climate science was no longer justified, and those spreading mistrust about these issues became deniers. As their arguments were increasingly refuted by the scientific community and new data, deniers turned to political arguments, making personal attacks on the reputation of scientists, and promoting ideas of a global warming conspiracy. With the 1989 fall of communism and the environmental movement's international reach at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, the attention of U.S. conservative think tanks, which had been organized in the 1970s as an intellectual counter movement to social socialism, turned from the «Red Scare» to the «Green Scare», which they saw as a threat to their aims of private property, free trade market economies and global capitalism. 
As a counter movement, they used environmental skepticism to promote denial of the reality of problems such as loss of biodiversity and climate change. In 1992, an EPA report linked secondhand smoke with lung cancer. The tobacco industry engaged the APCO Worldwide Public Relations Company, which set out a strategy of astroturfing campaigns to cast doubt on the science by linking smoking anxieties with other issues, including global warming, in order to turn public opinion against calls for government intervention. The campaign depicted public concerns as unfounded fears, supposedly based only on junk science, in contrast to the sound science", and operated through front groups, primarily the Advancement of Sound Science Center and its junk science website, run by Stephen Malloy. A tobacco company memo commented, "...doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. It is also the means of establishing a controversy." During the 1990s, the tobacco campaign died away, and TASSC began taking funding from oil companies including Exxon. Its website became central in distributing, "...almost every kind of climate change denial that has found its way into the popular press." In the 1990s, the Marshall Institute began campaigning against increased regulations on environmental issues such as acid rain, ozone depletion, secondhand smoke, and the dangers of DDT. In each case their argument was that the science was too uncertain to justify any government intervention, a strategy it borrowed from earlier efforts to downplay the health effects of tobacco in the 1980s. This campaign would continue for the next two decades. These efforts succeeded in influencing public perception of climate science. Between 1988 and the 1990s, public discourse shifted from the science and data of climate change to discussion of politics and surrounding controversy. The campaign to spread doubt continued into the 1990s, including an advertising campaign funded by coal industry advocates intended to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact", and a 1998 proposal written by the American Petroleum Institute intending to recruit scientists to convince politicians, the media and the public that climate science was too uncertain to warrant environmental regulation. The proposal included a $5 million multi-point strategy to maximize the impact of scientific views consistent with ours on Congress, the media and other key audiences", with a goal of "...raising questions about and undercutting the prevailing scientific wisdom." In 1998, Gelbspan noted that his fellow journalists accepted that global warming was occurring, but said they were in "...stage 2 denial of the climate crisis." unable to accept the feasibility of answers to the problem. A subsequent book by Milburn and Conrad on the politics of denial described, "...economic and psychological forces," producing denial of the consensus on global warming issues. These efforts by climate change denial groups were recognized as an organized campaign beginning in the 2000s. The sociologists Riley Dunlap and Aaron McCright played a significant role in this shift when they published an article in 2000 exploring the connection between conservative think tanks and climate change denial. Later work would continue the argument specific groups were marshalling skepticism against climate change. A study in 2008 from the University of Central Florida analyzed the sources of environmentally skeptical literature published in the United States. The analysis demonstrated that 92% of the literature was partly or wholly affiliated with a self-proclaimed conservative think tanks. A later piece of research from 2015 identified 4,556 individuals with overlapping network ties to 164 organizations which are responsible for the most efforts to downplay the threat of climate change in the U.S., Gelbspan's Boiling Point, published in 2004, detailed the fossil fuel industry's campaign to deny climate change and undermine public confidence in climate science. In Newsweek's August 2007 cover story, The Truth About Denial, Sharon Begley reported that 
the denial machine is running at full throttle, and said that this well coordinated, well funded campaign by contrarian scientists, free market think tanks, and industry had created a paralyzing fog of doubt around climate change. Referencing work of sociologists Robert Antonio and Robert Brule, Wayne A. White has written that climate change denial has become the top priority in a broader agenda against environmental regulation being pursued by neoliberals. Today, climate change skepticism is most prominently seen in the United States, where the media disproportionately features views of the climate change denial community. In addition to the media, the contrarian movement has also been sustained by the growth of the Internet, having gained some of its support from Internet bloggers, talk radio hosts and newspaper columnists. The New York Times and others reported in 2015 that oil companies knew that burning oil and gas could cause climate change and global warming since the 1970s but nonetheless funded deniers for years. Dana Nucatelli wrote in The Guardian that a small fringe group of climate deniers were no longer taken seriously at the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference, in an agreement that, "...we need to stop delaying and start getting serious about preventing a climate crisis." However, The New York Times says any implementation is voluntary and will depend on any future world leaders and every Republican candidate in 2016 has questioned or denied the science of climate change, Ernesto Arroyo, the new Minister of Foreign Affairs appointed by the newly elected president Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro has called global warming a plot by "...cultural Marxists", and has eliminated the climate change division of the ministry. Denial networks The climate change denial industry is most powerful in the United States. A Pentagon report has pointed out how climate denial threatens national security. A study from 2015 identified 4,556 individuals with overlapping network ties to 164 organizations which are responsible for the most efforts to downplay the threat of climate change in the U.S. In 2013 the Center for Media and Democracy reported that the State Policy Network SPN, an umbrella group of 64 U.S. think tanks, had been lobbying on behalf of major corporations and conservative donors to oppose climate change change regulation. International The Clexit Coalition claims to be a new international organization which aims to prevent ratification of the costly and dangerous Paris Global Warming Treaty. It has members in 26 countries. According to The Guardian newspaper, Clexit leaders are heavily involved in tobacco and fossil fuel funded organizations. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Arguments and positions on global warming. Some climate change denial groups say that because CO2 is only a trace gas in the atmosphere roughly 400 ppm, or 0.04%, it can only have a minor effect on the climate. Scientists have known for over a century that even this small proportion has a significant warming effect, and doubling the proportion leads to a large temperature increase. The scientific consensus, as summarized by the IPCC's fourth assessment report, the U.S. Geological Survey, and other reports, is that human activity is the leading cause of climate change. The burning of fossil fuels accounts for around 30 billion tons of CO2 each year, which is 130 times the amount produced by volcanoes. Some groups allege that water vapor is a more significant greenhouse gas, and is left out of many climate models. While water vapor is a greenhouse gas, the very short atmospheric lifetime of water vapor about 10 days compared that of CO2 hundreds of years means that CO2 is the primary driver of increasing temperatures. Water vapor acts as a feedback, not a forcing. 
Water vapor has been incorporated into climate models since their inception in the late 1800s. Climate denial groups may also argue that global warming stopped recently, a global warming hiatus, or that global temperatures are actually decreasing, leading to global cooling. These arguments are based on short term fluctuations, and ignore the long term pattern of warming. These groups often point to natural variability, such as sunspots and cosmic rays, to explain the warming trend. According to these groups, there is natural variability that will abate over time, and human influences have little to do with it. These factors are already taken into account when developing climate models, and the scientific consensus is that they cannot explain the observed warming trend. At a May 2018 meeting of the United States House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, Alabama's Representative Mo Brooks claimed that sea level rise is caused not by melting glaciers but rather by coastal erosion and silt that flows from rivers into the ocean. Climate change denial literature often features the suggestion that we should wait for better technologies before addressing climate change, when they will be more affordable and effective. Conspiracy theories Global warming conspiracy theories have been posited which allege that the scientific consensus is illusory, or that climatologists are acting on their own financial interests by causing undue alarm about a changing climate. Despite leaked emails during the Climatic Research Unit email controversy, as well as multinational, independent research on the topic, no evidence of such a conspiracy has been presented, and strong consensus exists among scientists from a multitude of political, social, organizational and national backgrounds about the extent and cause of climate change. Several researchers have concluded that around 97% of climate scientists agree with this consensus. As well, much of the data used in climate science is publicly available to be viewed and interpreted by competing researchers as well as the public. In 2012, research by Stefan Lewandowski, then of the University of Western Australia, concluded that belief in other conspiracy theories, such as that the FBI was responsible for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., was associated with being more likely to endorse climate change denial. In February 2015, climate change denial. Jim Inhofe, who had previously called climate change, the greatest hoax ever perpetrated against the American people, claimed to have debunked the alleged hoax when he brought a snowball with him in the U.S. Senate chamber and tossed it across the floor. He was succeeded in 2017 by John Barrasso, who similarly said, the climate is constantly changing. The role human activity plays is not known. Topic. Taxonomy of climate change denial In 2004 Stefan Ramstorff described how the media give the misleading impression that climate change was still disputed within the scientific community, attributing this impression to PR efforts of climate change skeptics. He identified different positions argued by climate skeptics, which he used as a taxonomy of climate change skepticism. Later, the model was also applied on denial. Trend skeptics, deniers who deny there is global warming, and argue that no significant climate warming is taking place at all, claiming that the warming trend measured by weather stations is an artifact due to urbanization around those stations. Urban heat island effect. Attribution skeptics deniers who accept the global warming trend but see natural causes for this, and doubt that human activities are responsible for the observed trends. A few of them even deny that the rise in the atmospheric CO2 content is anthropogenic while others argue that additional CO2 does not lead to discernible warming and that there must be other—natural—causes for warming. Impact skeptics, deniers, who think global warming is harmless or even beneficial. This taxonomy has been used in social science for analysis of publications, and to categorize climate change skepticism and climate change denial. Sometimes, a fourth category called, consensus denial, 
is added, which describes people who question the scientific consensus on anthropogenic global warming. The National Center for Science Education describes climate change denial as disputing differing points in the scientific consensus, a sequential range of arguments from denying the occurrence of climate change, accepting that but denying any significant human contribution, accepting these but denying scientific findings on how this would affect nature and human society, to accepting all these but denying that humans can mitigate or reduce the problems. James L. Powell provides a more extended list, as does climatologist Michael E. Mann in Six Stages of Denial, a ladder in which deniers have over time conceded acceptance of points, while retreating to a position which still rejects the mainstream consensus. CO2 is not actually increasing. Even if it is, the increase has no impact on the climate since there is no convincing evidence of warming. Even if there is warming, it is due to natural causes. Even if the warming cannot be explained by natural causes, the human impact is small, and the impact of continued greenhouse gas emissions will be minor. Even if the current and future projected human effects on Earth's climate are not negligible, the changes are generally going to be good for us. Whether or not the changes are going to be good for us, humans are very adept at adapting to changes, besides, it's too late to do anything about it, and or a technological fix is bound to come along when we really need it. Journalists and newspaper columnists including George Monbiot and Ellen Goodman, among others, have described climate change denial as a form of denialism. Denialism in this context has been defined by Chris and Mark Hufnagel as the use of rhetorical devices to give the appearance of legitimate debate where there is none, an approach that has the ultimate goal of rejecting a proposition on which a scientific consensus exists. This process characteristically uses one or more of the following tactics Allegations that scientific consensus involves conspiring to fake data or suppress the truth, a global warming conspiracy theory. Fake experts, or individuals with views at odds with established knowledge, at the same time marginalizing or denigrating published topic experts like the manufactured doubt over smoking and health, a few contrarian scientists oppose the climate consensus, some of them the same individuals. Selectivity, such as cherry-picking atypical or even obsolete papers, in the same way that the MMR vaccine controversy was based on one paper, examples include discredited ideas of the medieval warm period. Unworkable demands of research, claiming that any uncertainty invalidates the field or exaggerating uncertainty while rejecting probabilities and mathematical models. Logical fallacies. In 2015, environmentalist Bill McKibben accused President Obama, widely regarded as strongly in favor of action on climate change, of catastrophic climate change denial for his approval of oil drilling permits in offshore Alaska. According to McKibben, the president has also opened huge swaths of the Powder River Basin to new coal mining. McKibben calls this climate denial of the status quo sort, where the president denies the meaning of the science, which is that we must keep carbon in the ground. A study assessed the public perception and actions to climate change, on grounds of belief systems, and identified seven psychological barriers affecting the behavior that otherwise would facilitate mitigation, adaptation, and environmental stewardship. The author found the following barriers, cognition, ideological world views, comparisons to key people, costs and momentum, discredits toward experts and authorities, perceived risks of change, and inadequate behavioral changes. Pseudoscience <inaudible> 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 Various groups, including the National Center for Science Education, have described climate change denial as a form of pseudoscience. 
Climate change skepticism, while in some cases professing to do research on climate change, has focused instead on influencing the opinion of the public, legislators, and the media. In contrast to legitimate science, in a review of the book The Pseudoscience Wars, Emanuel Velikovsky and the Birth of the Modern Fringe by Michael D. Gordon, David Morrison wrote In his final chapter, Gordon turns to the new phase of pseudoscience, practiced by a few rogue scientists themselves. Climate change denialism is the prime example, where a handful of scientists, allied with an effective PR machine, are publicly challenging the scientific consensus that global warming is real and is due primarily to human consumption of fossil fuels. Scientists have watched in disbelief that as the evidence for global warming has become ever more solid, the deniers have been increasingly successful in the public and political arena. Today pseudoscience is still with us, and is as dangerous a challenge to science as it ever was in the past. Funding The total annual income of these climate change counter-movement organizations is roughly $900 million. Between 2002 and 2010, nearly $120 million, 77 million pounds was anonymously donated via the Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund to more than 100 organizations seeking to undermine the public perception of the science on climate change. Topic. Public opinion Public opinion on climate change is significantly impacted by media coverage of climate change, and the effects of climate change denial campaigns. Campaigns to undermine public confidence in climate science have decreased public belief in climate change, which in turn have impacted legislative efforts to curb CO2 emissions. United States A poll conducted by the New York Times Magazine in 2006 found that only 56% of Americans believe that average global temperatures have risen even though scientists think that they have. A majority of Americans also believe that scientists are still divided on the issue. A study found that public climate change policy support and behavior are significantly influenced by public beliefs, attitudes, and risk perceptions. As of March 2018, the rate of acceptance among US TV forecasters that the climate is changing has increased to 95%. The number of local television stories about global warming has also increased, by 15-fold. Climate Central has received some of the credit for this because they provide classes for meteorologists and graphics for television stations. The popular media in the U.S. gives greater attention to climate change skeptics than the scientific community as a whole, and the level of agreement within the scientific community has not been accurately communicated. In some cases, news outlets have allowed climate change skeptics to explain the science of climate change instead of experts in climatology. US and UK media coverage differ from that presented in other countries, where reporting is more consistent with the scientific literature. Some journalists attribute the difference to climate change denial being propagated, mainly in the U.S., by business-centered organizations employing tactics worked out previously by the U.S. tobacco lobby. In France, the U.S. and the U.K., the opinions of climate change skeptics appear much more frequently in conservative news outlets than other news, and in many cases those opinions are left uncontested. The efforts of Al Gore and other environmental campaigns have focused on the effects of global warming and have managed to increase awareness and concern, but despite these efforts, the number of Americans believing humans are the cause of global warming was holding steady at 61% in 2000. 2007, and those believing the popular media was understating the issue remained about 35%. A recent poll from 2015 suggests that while Americans are growing more aware of the dangers and implications of climate change for future generations, the majority are not worried about it. 
From a survey conducted in 2004, it was found that more than 30% of news presented in the previous decade showed equal attention to both human and non-human contributions to global warming. Topic: <laughs> Nationalism. It has been suggested that climate change can conflict with a nationalistic view because it is unsolvable at the national level and requires collective action between nations or between local communities, and that therefore populist nationalism tends to reject the science of climate change. In a TED talk Yuval Noah Harari notes, Nationalism has no solution to climate change. If you want to be a nationalist in the 21st century, you have to deny the problem. If you accept the reality of the problem, then you must accept that, yes, there is still room in the world for patriotism, there is still room in the world for having special loyalties and obligations towards your own people, towards your own country. I don't think anybody is really thinking of abolishing that. But in order to confront climate change, we need additional loyalties and commitments to a level beyond the nation. On the other hand, it has been argued that effective climate action is polycentric rather than international, and national interest in multilateral groups can be furthered by overcoming climate change denial. Climate change contrarians may believe in a caricature of internationalist state intervention that is perceived as threatening national sovereignty, and may re-attribute risks such as flooding to international institutions. UK Independence Party policy on climate change has been influenced by noted contrarian Christopher Monckton and then by its energy spokesman Roger Helmer MEP who stated in a speech, "...it is not clear that the rise in atmospheric CO2 is anthropogenic." Lobbying <inaudible> 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 Efforts to lobby against environmental regulation have included campaigns to manufacture doubt about the science behind climate change, and to obscure the scientific consensus and data. These efforts have undermined public confidence in climate science, and impacted climate change lobbying. The political advocacy organizations FreedomWorks and Americans for Prosperity, funded by brothers David and Charles Koch of Koch Industries, were important in supporting the Tea Party movement and in encouraging the movement to focus on climate change. Other conservative organizations such as the Heritage Foundation, Marshall Institute, Cato Institute and the American Enterprise Institute were significant participants in these lobbying attempts, seeking to halt or eliminate environmental regulations. This approach to downplay the significance of climate change was copied from tobacco lobbyists in the face of scientific evidence linking tobacco to lung cancer to prevent or delay the introduction of regulation. Lobbyists attempted to discredit the scientific research by creating doubt and manipulating debate. They worked to discredit the scientists involved, to dispute their findings, and to create and maintain an apparent controversy by promoting claims that contradicted scientific research. Quote, quote, doubt is our product. Boasted a now infamous 1969 industry memo. Doubt would shield the tobacco industry from litigation and regulation for decades to come. In 2006, George Monbiot wrote in The Guardian about similarities between the methods of groups funded by Exxon and those of the tobacco giant Philip Morris, including direct attacks on peer reviewed science and attempts to create public controversy and doubt. Former National Academy of Sciences President Frederick Seitz, who, according to an article by Mark Hartsgaard in Vanity Fair, earned about $585,000 in the 1970s and 1980s as a consultant to R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, went on to chair groups such as the Science and Environmental Policy Project and the George C. Marshall Institute alleged to have made efforts to downplay global warming. Sites stated in the 1980s that global warming is far more a matter of politics than of climate. Seitz authored the Oregon Petition, a document published jointly by the Marshall Institute and Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine in opposition to the Kyoto Protocol. 
the petition and accompanying research review of global warming evidence claimed the proposed limits on greenhouse gases would harm the environment, hinder the advance of science and technology, and damage the health and welfare of mankind. There is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will, in the foreseeable future, cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. We are living in an increasingly lush environment of plants and animals as a result of the carbon dioxide increase. Our children will enjoy an earth with far more plant and animal life than that with which we now are blessed. This is a wonderful and unexpected gift from the Industrial Revolution. George Monbiot wrote in The Guardian that this petition, which he criticizes as misleading and tied to industry funding, has been cited by almost every journalist who claims that climate change is a myth. Efforts by climate change denial groups played a significant role in the eventual rejection of the Kyoto Protocol in the U.S. Monbio has written about another group founded by the tobacco lobby, the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition (TASSC), that now campaigns against measures to combat global warming in again trying to manufacture the appearance of a grassroots movement against unfounded fear and over-regulation. Monbio states that TASSC has done more damage to the campaign to halt climate change than any other body. Drexel University environmental sociologist Robert Brule analyzed the funding of 91 organizations opposed to restrictions on carbon emissions, which he termed the climate change counter movement between 2003 and 2013 the donor advised funds donors trust and donors capital fund combined were the largest funders accounting for about one quarter of the total funds and the american enterprise institute was the largest recipient 16 percent of the total funds the study also found that the amount of money donated to these organizations by means of foundations whose funding sources cannot be traced had risen. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Private sector. Several large corporations within the fossil fuel industry provide significant funding for attempts to mislead the public about the trustworthiness of climate science. ExxonMobil and the Koch Family Foundations have been identified as especially influential funders of climate change contrarianism. The bankruptcy of the coal company Cloudpeak Energy revealed it funded the Institute for Energy Research, a climate denial think tank, as well as several other policy influences. After the IPCC released its February 2007 report, the American Enterprise Institute offered British, American, and other scientists $10,000 plus travel expenses to publish articles critical of the assessment. The Institute had received more than $1.6 million from Exxon, and its vice chairman of trustees was former head of Exxon Lee Raymond. Raymond sent letters that alleged the IPCC report was not supported by the analytical work. More than 20 AEI employees worked as consultants to the George W. Bush administration. Despite her initial conviction that climate change denial would abate with time, Senator Barbara Boxer said that when she learned of the AEI's offer, she "...realized there was a movement behind this that just wasn't giving up." The Royal Society conducted a survey that found ExxonMobil had given $2.9 million to American groups that "...misinformed the public about climate change," 39 of which misrepresented the science of climate change by outright denial of the evidence." In 2006, the Royal Society issued a demand that ExxonMobil withdraw funding for climate change denial. The letter drew criticism, notably from Timothy Ball who argued the Society attempted to "...politicize the private funding of science and to censor scientific debate." ExxonMobil denied that it has been trying to mislead the public about global warming. 
A spokesman, Gant Walton, said that ExxonMobil's funding of research does not mean that it acts to influence the research, and that ExxonMobil supports taking action to curb the output of greenhouse gases. Research conducted at an Exxon archival collection at the University of Texas and interviews with former employees by journalists indicate the scientific opinion within the company and their public posture towards climate change was contradictory. Between 1989 and 2002, the Global Climate Coalition, a group of mainly United States businesses, used aggressive lobbying and public relations tactics to oppose action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight the Kyoto Protocol. The coalition was financed by large corporations and trade groups from the oil, coal and auto industries. The New York Times reported that, "...even as the coalition worked to sway opinion towards skepticism, its own scientific and technical experts were advising that the science backing the role of greenhouse gases in global warming could not be refuted." In 2000, Ford Motor Company was the first company to leave the coalition as a result of pressure from environmentalists, followed by Daimler Chrysler, Texaco, the Southern Company and General Motors subsequently left to GCC. The organization closed in 2002. From January 2009 through June 2010, the oil, coal and utility industries spent $500 million in lobby expenditures in opposition to legislation to address climate change. In early 2015, several media reports emerged saying that Willie Soon, a popular scientist among climate change deniers, had failed to disclose conflicts of interest in at least 11 scientific papers published since 2008. They reported that he received a total of $1.25 million from ExxonMobil, Southern Company, the American Petroleum Institute and a foundation run by the Koch brothers. Charles R. Alcock, director of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where Soon was based, said that allowing funders of Soon's work to prohibit disclosure of funding sources was a mistake, which will not be permitted in future grant agreements. Public sector The Republican Party in the United States is unique in denying anthropogenic climate change among conservative political parties across the Western world. In 1994, according to a leaked memo, the Republican strategist Frank Luntz advised members of the Republican Party, with regard to climate change, that you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue and challenge the science by recruiting experts who are sympathetic to your view. In 2006, Lunt said he still believes, back in 97, 98, the science was uncertain. But he now agrees with the scientific consensus. From 2008 to 2017, the Republican Party went from debating how to combat human caused climate change to arguing that it does not exist. According to The New York Times, in 2011, more than half of the Republicans in the House and three quarters of Republican senators said, that the threat of global warming, as a man-made and highly threatening phenomenon, is at best an exaggeration and at worst an utter hoax." Quote, quote, according to Judith Warner writing in the New York Times magazine. In 2014, more than 55 percent of congressional Republicans were climate change deniers, according to NBC News. According to PolitiFact in May 2014, Jerry Brown's statement that virtually no Republican in Washington accepts climate change science, was mostly true. PolitiFact counted, 8 out of 278, or about 3 percent, of Republican members of Congress who accept the prevailing scientific conclusion that global warming is both real and man-made. In 2005, The New York Times reported that Philip Cooney, former fossil fuel lobbyist and climate team leader at the American Petroleum Institute and President George W. Bush's chief of staff of the Council on Environmental Quality, had 
repeatedly edited government climate reports in ways that played down links between such emissions and global warming, according to internal documents. Sharon Begley reported in Newsweek that Cooney edited a 2002 report on climate science by sprinkling it with phrases such as lack of understanding and considerable uncertainty. Cooney reportedly removed an entire section on climate in one report, whereupon another lobbyist sent him a fax saying, You are doing a great job. Cooney announced his resignation two days after the story of his tampering with scientific reports broke, but a few days later it was announced that Cooney would take up a position with ExxonMobil, United States Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, in a 19 June 2017 interview with CNBC, acknowledged the existence of climate change and impact from humans, but said that he did not agree with the idea that carbon dioxide was the primary driver of global warming pointing instead to the ocean waters and this environment that we live in." The American Meteorological Society responded in a letter to Perry saying that it is, "...critically important that you understand that emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are the primary cause." Pointing to conclusions of scientists worldwide, Republican Jim Bridenstein, the first elected politician to serve as NASA administrator, had previously stated that global temperatures were not rising. A month after the Senate confirmed his NASA position in April 2018, he acknowledged that human emissions of greenhouse gases are raising global temperatures. Schools. According to documents leaked in February 2012, the Heartland Institute is developing a curriculum for use in schools which frames climate change as a scientific controversy. In 2017, Glenn Branch, Deputy Director of the National Center for Science Education NCSE, wrote that, "...the Heartland Institute is continuing to inflict its climate change denial literature on science teachers across the country." He also described how some science teachers were reacting to Heartland's mailings. Fortunately, the Heartland mailing continues to be greeted with skepticism and dismissed with scorn. The NCSE has prepared classroom resources in response to Heartland and other anti science threats. Branch also referred to an article by climatefeedback.org which reviewed an unsolicited Heartland booklet, entitled why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming", which was sent to science teachers in the United States. Their intention was to send it to, "...more than 200,000 K-12 teachers". Each significant claim was rated for accuracy by scientists who were experts on that topic. Overall, they scored the accuracy of the booklet with an F. It could hardly score lower. And the Key findings section are incorrect, misleading, based on flawed logic, or simply factually inaccurate. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Effect. Manufactured uncertainty over climate change, the fundamental strategy of climate change denial, has been very effective, particularly in the U.S. It has contributed to low levels of public concern and to government inaction worldwide. An Angus Reid poll released in 2010 indicates that global warming skepticism in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom has been rising. There may be multiple causes of this trend, including a focus on economic rather than environmental issues, and a negative perception of the United Nations and its role in discussing climate change. Another cause may be weariness from overexposure to the topic. Secondary polls suggest that the public may have been discouraged by extremism when discussing the topic, while other polls show 54% of U.S. voters believe that. The news media make global warming appear worse than it really is. A poll in 2009 regarding the issue of whether, some scientists have falsified research data to support their own theories and beliefs about global warming, showed that 59% of Americans believed it, at least somewhat likely, 
with 35% believing it was very likely, according to Tim Worth. They patterned what they did after the tobacco industry. Both figured, so enough doubt, call the science uncertain and in dispute. That's had a huge impact on both the public and Congress. This approach has been propagated by the U.S. media, presenting a false balance between climate science and climate skeptics. Newsweek reports that the majority of Europe and Japan accept the consensus on scientific climate change, but only one-third of Americans considered human activity to play a major role in climate change in 2006, 64% believed that scientists disagreed about it. A lot. A 2007 Newsweek poll found these numbers were declining, although majorities of Americans still believed that scientists were uncertain about climate change and its causes. Rush Holt wrote a piece for Science, which appeared in Newsweek. For more than two decades scientists have been issuing warnings that the release of greenhouse gases, principally carbon dioxide CO2, is probably altering Earth's climate in ways that will be expensive and even deadly. The American public yawned and bought bigger cars. Statements by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and others underscored the warnings and called for new government policies to deal with climate change. Politicians, presented with noisy statistics, shrugged, said there is too much doubt among scientists, and did nothing. Deliberate attempts by the Western Fuels Association to confuse the public have succeeded in their objectives. This has been exacerbated by media treatment of the climate issue. According to a Pew poll in 2012, 57% of the U.S. public are unaware of, or outright reject, the scientific consensus on climate change. Some organizations promoting climate change denial have asserted that scientists are increasingly rejecting climate change, but this notion is contradicted by research showing that 97% of published papers endorse the scientific consensus, and that percentage is increasing with time. Social psychologist Craig Foster compares climate change denialists to flat earth believers and the reaction to the latter by the scientific community. Foster states, the potential and kinetic energy devoted to counter the flat earth movement is wasteful and misguided. I don't understand why anybody would worry about the flat earth gnat while facing the climate change mammoth. Climate change denial does not require belief. It only requires neglect. In 2016, Aaron McCright argued that anti-environmentalism, and climate change denial specifically has expanded to a point in the US where it has now become a central tenet of the current conservative and republican identity on the other hand global oil companies have begun to acknowledge the existence of climate change and its risks manufactured climate change denial is also influencing how scientific knowledge is communicated to the public According to climate scientist Michael E. Mann, universities and scientific societies and organizations, publishers, etc., are too often risk averse when it comes to defending and communicating science that is perceived as threatening by powerful interests. See also Agnotology Environmental skepticism Anti-environmentalism Climate alarmist Effects of global warming Information Council on the Environment International Conference on Climate Change Motivated reasoning Renewable energy commercialization, non-technical barriers to acceptance Semmelweis reflex List of scientists opposing the mainstream scientific assessment of global warming Political positions of Donald Trump, climate change and pollution Films Climate change denial disorder, satirical parody film about a fictional disease 
Before the Flood, documenting climate change denial and lobbying processes. <laughs>